Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study. Revelation chapter 13, verse 9 and 10 is what we're going to look at. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. I like this one. I like this study. Um, we're going to spend a little time dealing with captivity. I want you to think of captivity being in prison or being in bondage. All right, Being in bondage, let's say, uh, and everybody, everybody that I've ever met, known, everybody that's walked on two legs on this planet has been captive in one way or another. We have, we are captive by our emotions or feelings, our own weaknesses, the frailties of our flesh, the lusts of our flesh, the lust of our eyes. Um, you can consider yourself pretty strong in that you don't go around stealing stuff all day long. You haven't killed anybody in your life. Things are pretty good in your marriage. But covetousness, that's a tough one to beat. It's hard to not look at something that belongs to somebody else. I don't care what or who it is and, and not go, well, I wish I had that. That's covetousness. It just comes with the package. And we get tired of being in bondage. We get tired of being in captivity to those things. The, the hope and the patience uh, and the faith of the saints is just keep in mind that he that has brought you into captivity will go into captivity. In fact, and, and he killed with the sword must be killed with the sword. In fact, um, in Revelation 17, and this is speaking of the beast. Revelation 17, 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. You know what perdition is? Destruction. Lake of fire. That he's going to come out of the pit out, we have an expression, out of the frying pan, into the fire. And that's what that is. And God is wanting you, he's, he's giving you understanding and hope. Because we've dealt with this verse. Um, verse 7, it was given to him, in Revelation 13, 7, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them. So yes, we are overcome of certain things. Again, it's all part of the package that you and I live in called this flesh. But here is our, here's our patience. We wait on the Lord and our faith. We trust God. I don't trust me. I don't trust the promises that I try to make to God. They're eventually going to fail. I don't trust me. I don't trust this flesh. I don't, it's not capable of doing very good at all. I have to have patience with God. And this is something, I get called on this a lot. People will call, Pastor, I struggle with this. I struggle with this. I have a hard time getting rid of that. This geez, keeps coming back in my life. And so on and so on. And most of them are related to sin. And I ask them, I always ask the same question. Have you asked God to take this away from you? And they always say, yes, I have, as tears run down their eyes. I always ask them, D did you mean it? And they always say, I, 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 th I guess I did, I think I did. And I always tell them, I believe you. I believe that you meant it. I believe that you got down on your face with tears in your eyes before the Almighty God, which means He can do anything and everything. I believe that you asked in sincerity for God to deliver you from the bondage and the captivity that you're under in that body of flesh that you inhabit right now. So what? Do we think that God is waiting now, now that we've asked God to do it, is God now waiting for us to make the first move? Is that, is that how it works? That's not how it works. That's not what he said. 
It's not how he led the Israelites in the promised land. God did not wait for the Israelites to get up and make the first move. God always told them, when you get up in the morning and you see the pillar of cloud there at the tabernacle, that means we're staying right there. If you get up one morning, you see that I've moved the pillar of cloud over to the next valley, I'll wait on you, but that means get up and let's go. God never, God never sat in the tabernacle in that pillar of cloud and told Israel, aren't you ready to move yet? I'm waiting for you to take the first move. I can't move unless you do. That God, I don't worship that God. I don't believe in that God. That's not the God that wrote this Bible. The God that wrote this Bible told us over and over and over again, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, trust in the Lord, wait on the Lord. Boy, I, tell, I wish I could was prepared to do that study, um, and I may. I may do that next week as part of this. I don't know if I'll get this done or not. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. What, what, who, who was that to? Those that wait on the Lord. What did Jesus tell the disciples to do when they went back to Jerusalem after he ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1? He told them the first thing out of his mouth was, wait. Just wait. Wait on the Lord. If you ask God to do it, why would you think that God is now waiting for you to do it? Why would you think? And I know, I know there are people out there who teach that. I know there, you probably have friends who have told you, well, God's waiting for you to take the first step now. I mean, God wants to know that you're, God doesn't know if you're serious or not unless you do. Are you kidding me? God did what? God doesn't know that you were serious? God's waiting on you to perform some action or function or deed to show God that you really meant it this time? God knows your heart. God saw the tears. He put them in a bottle, he says. He stored them up. He saved them. He heard every prayer. He heard every cry. And I guarantee you, there's, there's some joker out there that says, Yay, old man upstairs, why don't you forgive me for this? And God's just going, You clown. I have, there's no way in the world I'm going to forgive you. I know you're just joking. I know you're not serious. I know I, God knows the difference. God sees you. He sees you down on your face, you're bawling your eyes out, you're beating the floor, you can't take it anymore, you're afraid that you're going to die and go to hell, and you're begging God to remove you from transgressions and sins and captivity and things that are holding you in bondage. And you're begging God to remove them from you. Wait. Because God knows that you were serious about it. He's never turned his children down. Not even the Apostle Paul. When the Apostle Paul had a messenger of Satan buffeting him daily, Paul said in one place, he had a thorn in his flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet him. He says in another place, for I'm buffeted daily. Every day, Paul had something in his flesh that he wanted out. It was a thorn. It stung. It hurt. He wanted deliverance. He asked God three times. You think God was going, well, I'm waiting for you to take first step, Paul. Did God say that? No, he said, Paul, tell you what. I'll leave it in there. I'll leave it in there. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I, in fact, you're asking me to take the thorn out. I actually know better than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm wiser than you. I made you. And I know how things will work best to glorify me. So, Paul, I'm going to leave that in there. And I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you mercy. I'm going to give you forgiveness. I'm going to give you pardon. I'm going to give you restoration. I'll just be your God. You be my son. And when Paul received that word from the Lord, he accepted it. He didn't argue. He said, God, I'll do that. That way, you know me, God. You get the glory, and I won't. You weaken me however much you want to so that you be strong through me and in me so that when everybody starts talking about what's happening, they'll give the glory. I and them will give the glory to you rather than giving the glory to me and me taking it. They that wait on the Lord. Here's the patience and the faith of saints. Is that he that leads you into captivity 
He's going to captivity while God sets you free. Think about what they do with your carcass. What do they do with it? And in this century, in these times, we put it in a box and nail it shut. It's going to be held captive there for the rest of the time of this earth. So this Bible's right. Learn to trust it. Learn to believe what God said. Learn to accept what God said instead of man's wisdom in replacement of that. Anyway, let's look at captivity and God delivering and setting captives free and those who kept them captive, what he does to them. In Judges chapter 5, verse 12, um, this is the song of Deborah, I believe. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak, not Obama. This is Barak, the, the captain of the host of Israel. Deborah was the judge at that time, and Barak was um, her warrior, her, her captain of the, of the army. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive. Go grab the guy that's held you captive and put him in chains. See how he likes it. Now you're free and he's not. Thou son of Abinoam, then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. I love it. I love, that's Revelation 13.10. Here's your patience and here's your faith. God what, what has dominion over you right now? The law, the strength of the law, the thorns. What has dominion over you right now? You're going to have dominion over one of these days. See it? I love this. Job 42.10 The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. That, that falls perfectly in line with Isaiah 40 when God said, comfort ye, comfort ye. Why do you say it twice? Old Testament, New Testament. First coming, second coming. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. And he said, for, the, for your sins I'm going to give you double. Not a double punishment, but I'm going to give you a double blessing. Comfort ye, comfort ye. You see that? Comfort is the Holy Spirit. Second outpouring of the Holy Spirit here. Uh, Elisha gets the double portion of Elijah's spirit. Elijah's taken up into heaven. That's us. Elisha is the 12 tribes of Israel because when Elijah grabbed Elisha, what was he doing? He was plowing the 12, 12 yoke of oxen. There it is right there. It's your 12 tribes. And then Elisha ends up getting the double blessing. And that's what God did. He turned the captivity of Job. Job was in bondage. The devil put him in bondage by um, destroying his family, destroying all of his wealth and everything like that. Then when that didn't work, he, he held captive his flesh. Boils and sores coming out of him. And he's scraping the, the gunk with um, little shards of pottery. He's in captivity, and God turned that captivity. Job prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Whew. Amen to that. So you kind of get um, the idea here. Oh, by the way, I just saw a note here that I put into the text here. Job, the book of Job, has 42 chapters. Think about that. Um, and the beast continues for how long? 42 months. I think there's a connection here. I don't know what it all means, but I think there's a connection. Because the Bible mentions in the 42nd chapter of Job that the, the things that were going on with Job were captivity. That's what they were. He was in, he was being held captive, and at the 42nd chapter, God released him from that, all right? Uh, so anyway, um, and I actually have, the I was doing it from memory, but I have the, the note here, Isaiah 40. Let me read that to you. Comfort ye, comfort ye, 
My people, saith your God, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. You know when you speak comfortably, somebody quotes scripture to them, that we through patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. Two things. Warfare is accomplished, iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. It's funny, while I'm reading this, I'm hearing Handel's Messiah in my head. I'm hearing the guy singing, every valley. That's what I'm hearing. You ought to listen to it. Greatest mixture of music and scripture that there ever was is Handel's Messiah. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain um, and hills shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places... Pl you know, I, I just like the counts in it. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, the crooked made straight, and the rough places plain. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed... And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as, as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I like it. It's the, that is the doctrine of the preservation of every word of God. Yes, the, and by the way, it says flesh and grass. The early Bible was written on two things, papyrus and vellum. Papyrus is where we get the word paper. Do you know what papyrus was? It was a very long-stemmed, multi-layered grass. That's what it was. It was gra they were writing on grass. Okay? You know what vellum was? Animal skin. Flesh. They were writing on flesh. And of course, the, the, the uh, grass and the flesh withereth and fadeth away. But the Word of God standeth forever. It was preserved. Just because the manuscripts fell into disrepair and were fragmented and decayed, God said, I'm going to preserve my word no matter what, and I won't rely upon the earliest manuscripts in order to do it. Hallelujah. By the way, the word comfort, you're going to like this. Comfort ye, comfort ye. 66 times in the King James Bible. We have this little program Okay, get you a cup of Pure Bible Search software, all right? Uh, by the way, somebody asked me for one of these cups. I only, this is the only one. It's the only one I have. Um, our software lady made this, and you can go to, what is that, Vistaprint. Get one made up, all right? Uh, we, don't, we don't have any here. But you can get you a cup of Pure Bible Search software. You can, you can type in the word comfort 66 times, 66 books in the Bible, 66 chapters in Isaiah. It's, it's all there. I love it. Psalm 14.7. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice in Israel shall be glad. He's talking about this, the salvation of Israel um, is going to come out of Zion and it's, it's the salvation of Israel is he's going to bring back the captivity of his people. He's going to set them free from the captivity they're in. Psalm um, 53.6, all oh, that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion same verse again. I, I love this. When, the, when, when God bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. It says it twice. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith the Lord. Psalm 68, 18. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Think of who ascended on high. Christ. He goes up into, he, he's uh, taken into heaven in a cloud, and he ascends, and he's at the right hand of the Father, and he's going to lead captivity captive. That's what he said back here in Judges, that Barak, not Obama, was going to lead thy captivity captive. 
He's going to take your captors and that which holds you in bondage and he is going to bring them into bondage and into captivity. Thou hast received gifts for men. That's the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of salvation. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. See, God's going to save Israel. And right now, there isn't um, a more stinkier religion than the Kabbalah religion of the Jews right now. It stinks to high heaven. It's so full of mystery Babylonian stuff and so full of goddess worship and it's the basically it's Baal and Ashtaroth. It's exactly what God hated back in the Old Testament. That's what the Kabbalah is. It's what Masonry and the New Age movement and all this other junk, it's what it's based on, all right? It all stems from Jewish Kabbalah. God, they're very rebellious right now. Hath God cast away his people whom he foreknew? God forbid. He's not going to do that. He's going to take the rebellious people. He's going to soften their heart. He's going to break them. He's going to forgive all of their sins. He's going to give them the new covenant. That's Jeremiah 31. He's going to forgive all of their sins, all of her iniquity, everything she's ever done rotten and wrong. God's going to forgive that. Those that wait. Psalm 85, 1. Lord, hast thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered... 90% of their sin, it doesn't say that, does it? Thou hast covered all their sin. Covered it with what? Blood. Selah, think about that. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Turn us, O God. What does that mean? It means, God, you turn my head back around where it needs to be so that I worship you the way I'm supposed to, so that I do what I'm supposed to, so that I'm free from my iniquities. God turns us. Verse 5, Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine hand, or, or wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? The answer is no. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak salvation. Uh, or no, he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them, not re let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Think of... Um, if you think that's a little weird, think of what Isaiah said, Seek ye out the book of the Lord. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. And that's what he's saying here. Mercy and truth are met together. Mercy and truth. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Just like Christ and his bride. Old Testament, New Testament. Beautiful. I love it. It's beautiful. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. It's all promises that God makes when he leads captivity captive. Psalm 106, 44. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry, and he remembered that for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. See, God is, the, God is going to get to a point where he's going to say, I'm done being angry at you. Have you ever had that happen where you've just been bitter and mad at somebody, you know, like your wife, your husband, and you just reached a point to where you said, I'm not going to be angry anymore. I'm not going to be bitter anymore. I'm done. It's over with. I'm going to remember our covenant for better for worse, and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. He made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captives. See, look at that. He made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captives. The people that put them in bondage are going to feel sorry for them. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. 
Psalm 126, 1, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, He turned it, He put them in captivity, and He's going to turn it again. He's going to bring them back. We were like them that dream. I want to stop for a minute. You ever had dreams? Um, ideas of how things were going to be? Remember when you were getting married? You had hopes and dreams of how things would be. You know what happens. You know, we dream. We have these real vivid dreams. And then we wake up, and within about three to five seconds, we can just barely remember what it was we were seeing in that dream. You think about that. He said, when the Lord turned again to captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. In other words, we had this amazing dream or vision of how good things could be, but we awoke to a reality and we said, that'll never happen. Never happen. Things aren't, uh, things aren't good in my life. I, I, me personally, Mike, had hopes and dreams of how my life was going to turn out at a young age of even who I was going to marry, and so on and so on. It didn't turn out that way. And I got to a point in life to where, why bother? It's like the Shunammite woman who had dreamed of having a little boy all of her life. That's why she took in Elisha. She, I can see that. He's like the son she never had. She had it in her nature to take care of somebody so she kind of adopted Elisha. And Elisha asked, who is it, I think Gehazi, his servant, he said, what does this woman need? Well, Lord, she's never had a, never had a child. You go tell her she's going to have one. Shunammite woman said, don't. Don't bring this back up. I gave up on having a little boy a long time ago. Don't, I don't want to hear this. You're just filling me with false hope. Can I, I want to unhook the train for a minute. You know, why, you know why some of you got burned out of church and you're not back in one right now? Because some ratbag preacher filled your head with all kinds of promises that God never made, therefore they were not kept. And you followed that. And then all of a sudden you realized it wasn't working. And you just decided, I mean, you kind of still believe in God, but you just gave up on that stuff, and you got burnt. And here's that Shunammite woman saying, I don't want to hear this. I don't want these emotions and these feelings coming back on me. And, Geha and this, I think it was Gehazi, but it's the servant of Elijah said, no, I'm telling you, this time next year, you'll be nursing a baby. Lo and behold, at the exact time, the man of God said, she has a child. Now she's happy and she's raising the child. She just, man, Lord, you're so good. You know what happened? That child died in her arms. You think you've had it tough. And maybe you've had a situation like this in some form or another. That's why all these things are written in that Bible. And she went to that man of God and she said, I told you. I was better off not even having the child. So what? God hates me so much that he gives it to me and then kills him. I just don't know what to think anymore. And the man of God took and he you got to read the Bible on this thing. Put his hands on that boy's hands and, and just went over him like this. And the child sneezed seven times and he came back to life. And see, we get used to, we've had dreams of how we hoped life would turn out. And then one day we're sitting in a pile of rubble. And all those dreams are gone. So we were like them that dream. 
but you, you wake up and the dream's gone. You still believe in God, but you've been burned so bad. You believe you actually have reconciled in your mind that either some things are impossible with God or it's because I'm so bad that God won't do this for me. Ring a bell? Of course you're bad. Of course you're a sinner. Of course you do things you don't want to do. Think things you don't want to think, say things you don't want to say. It's all there. Of course you do. Of course you're a sinner. You're the one Christ died for, remember? He didn't die for the good people that don't do anything wrong. He died for you. And what was he waiting on from you? To die for you. He died before you ever came on. He died for you before you ever came on the scene. Whew. Anyway, so we, you know what you've done? You've given up on thinking that God will deliver you. You're like them that dream. You gave up. Let's eat and drink and be merry. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I just, I don't know. I, d I don't want to go to hell. I still believe in hell. I still, I, I don't, but I just don't know. I mean, I'm being told that I have to live this immaculate life in order to be a Christian. And I'm being told if, I've, if I have this issue or this problem, it's obviously I'm not saved. And I, I've just been told that. And I, I, I just don't know. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how they do it. Let me tell you a little secret. They don't. They don't. Everybody's got their stuff. Everybody's got their junk they got to carry around. Some just hide it better than others. Some hide it and then pretend that it doesn't exist and then come down on you. That's what this book says. That's what it says. There is none righteous, no, not one. So you've given up. You've been in captivity so long. Charles Manson, there's a gal that's going to marry him. She's going to have a marriage license made out so she can have access to some of his information. She's going to try to get him out. I don't know what she's trying to do. Try to get him out of prison or what? He's 80 some odd years old. He's been in there since the early 70s. They said, his last parole hearing, they said, We're, we don't think he's a threat to anybody. We're just not going to let him out. He's institutionalized. He's lived so long in prison, he won't survive outside of here. Think about that. You've been in bondage so long, you gave up a long time ago. You wouldn't know freedom if it slapped you in the face. You just, you quit, you gave up. Wait, you see, he's telling you this is your patience and your faith. Don't quit. Don't give up. Please, don't. I know what it's like. I wanted to. God wouldn't let me. God wouldn't let me. So, then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. <sighs> they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And he that goeth forth with weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Underline in your Bible the word doubtless. Does that mean if I don't have any doubts now, this will happen? No. God's saying, don't doubt it because I am going to do it. I mean, just think, look at the illustration he gives here. He that goeth forth with weeping, bearing precious seed. How hard do you have to cry in order to get carrots to grow in your garden? How much faith do you have to have once you plant seeds? 
in order for it to grow. The faith part was just sowing the seed. The seed does what it does. It takes care of itself. That's this. I've said this before, but God gave me this passage um, the night before I stood over my dad's casket because I couldn't preach the funeral. No way, no how. I thought I can kind of, maybe I can handle the gravesite, but I don't know what I'm going to say. And God gave me this, and, and really it meant something to me personally. It was real to me. And I realized that I was not losing my dad. I was planting. I was sowing with tears. And I'm going to reap in joy. Here's my patience. And here's my faith. I miss my dad. I miss my little grandbaby. Before, probably before my life's over, I'm going to end up missing a lot of people. But I'll wait. I'll wait for it. It'll be worth it. I'll wait for it. Don't give up, please. Okay? Don't give up. Isaiah 14, 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Where is this nonsense that the Jews are going to be saved by works in the, in the end times? Where is that, where is that nonsense at? That's the, he didn't say that here. He just said, I'm going to have mercy on Jacob and I'm going to choose Israel and I'm going to set them in their own land. Okay, God, do it. I'm right there with you. The people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. They shall take them captives, whose captives they were. Did you see that? That's what leading captivity captive means. We're going to take the guys who were holding us, we're going to hold them. And if it's devils, if it's spirits that are holding us in captivity, we're going to, we're going to hold them whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. So we're going we're gonna to judge angels. We're going to rule over angels. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. I'm, I'm glad I'm doing this Bible study. Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is when Jesus opened the book in Luke chapter 4. Uh, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, He has set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Some of you know about prison, literally and emotionally or spiritually. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that more. Set comfort, Holy Ghost term, 66 times in your Bible. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I want you to notice um, in verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them. See, the word give is a gift, unearned, unworked for. God said he was not going to make them earn it. He was going to give it to them. Uh, the spirit of heaviness that they may be called trees of righteousness, like um, in uh, Psalm chapter 1. Therefore he shall be like a tree. And the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations, and strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame ye shall have double. And for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Look at that. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. And when, you know when this happens? 
Jesus told you when it was going to happen. Well, he showed you when it was going to happen. In Luke 4, you go read it, it's when he opens the book and looses the seals. Mm, beautiful. Jeremiah 30, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers. They shall possess it. What, what part of this, Tex Mars, don't you understand? What part of this don't you understand? We're not, we didn't replace Israel. We're grafted into the tree. Of that I have no doubt. But God is able to take those natural branches and graft them back in again. And that is exactly what he's going to do. He said it right here. God didn't give my fathers that land. He gave the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He gave them that land and he's going to give it back to them. What don't you understand? Jeremiah 30, verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet. None shall make him afraid. He's going to bring them back from the land of their captivity. Um, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. Well, I believe we've replaced Israel, and I, that promise is for us. Well, then that promise doesn't make sense. He scattered Israel throughout all the nations. He's going to make a full end of those nations. He's going to bring them back. He's not going to make a full end of them. He, he, he swore to it. He promised. And if God breaks a promise to the apple of his eye, who are you? But I will correct thee in measure... And will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So, yeah, some of the things that have befallen you in life is God punishing you. I've been punished by my parents, by my fifth grade teacher, by my seventh grade teacher. Yeah, I've been punished by them. None of them killed me. None of them did. They didn't want to either. My mom said it a couple times. She didn't really want to. So do we get punished for things we do wrong? Absolutely. It's because we're God's children. But that just means that if he can chastise us now, that just means that we get to remain his sons and receive the inheritance. For thus saith the Lord, thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. Your, your bruise and your wound is incurable, it's grievous. We have, a, we have an incurable disease called sin. And in verse 16 he said, Therefore all they that devour thee shall be devoured. He's going to devour the devourer. Um, think of John the Baptist eating locusts. Locusts are the devourer, and John the Baptist is eating the devourer. Okay? Therefore all they that devour thee shall be devoured. All thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Whew, I like it. They that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. Jeremiah 32, 44. I'm just, I'm getting there. Men shall buy, this is uh, Jeremiah 32, this is the sealed and the unsealed book. Go read it. There's a, there's a title, deed, of property, and the custom was take one, take, make two copies of it. One is sealed, one is unsealed. I, this is so cool. I've talked about this in Pastor Mike Online. You have two books in your Bible that deal with prophecy, primarily Daniel and Revelation. Daniel's 27th book of the Old Testament, Revelation's 27th book of the New Testament. Daniel is sealed. It says so in Daniel 12. Revelation is unsealed, not sealed. Revelation 22. Go read those things. And that's just beautiful. One of these days he's going to unseal the book. 
Anyway, that's what this is. Men shall buy fields for money and subscribe evidences and seal them and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin and in the places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah and the cities of the mountains and the cities of the valleys, the cities of the south. For I will cause their captivity to return, saith the Lord. And I like to teach this. You, where did Jeremiah put the two books? In earthen vessels. You go find that verse out on your own. Okay? Jeremiah 33, 6. Behold, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them and reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. That's what God does when He saves you. And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return, and will build them as at the first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity if they do good works. No, it's not what it says. It doesn't say that. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. End of statement. End of clause. It's what God said. I do not believe that Israel is saved by a different gospel whereby they have to do works to maintain... That's, that's not, what it's, it's not what it says. It's not what it says. Jeremiah 33.10 Thus saith the Lord again, there shall be heard in this place which ye, shall, which ye say shall be desolate without man and without beast, even the, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man and without inhabitant, without beast. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride and the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for His mercy endureth forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith the Lord. Now here's what's interesting is that they said of Jerusalem at one time that they don't hear the man, uh, they don't hear the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride. They don't hear those voices in Jerusalem, and they think that they're never going to hear them again. God says, not so. I'm going to bring back, you're going to rebuild all these old towns and cities, and, and, um, and everything that was lying waste where no man was, I'm going to bring you all back in there. Then we'll throw something at you. Just a thought. Jerusalem was, was not inhabited for a couple thousand years by Jews. But it was inhabited by Romans, Knights Templars, the um, Moors, which are Muslims. It was inhabited by all them all this time. There has never been a time where Jerusalem was just cleaned out. It makes me ask the question, how literal is this? And if it hasn't happened yet, will it not happen? Something to think about. But anyway, here's the connection. Where he says in Jeremiah 33, 11, he talks about the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride. And all this, it's basically the, well, you know the bridegroom and the bride, don't you? Christ and His church. That's in Revelation 18. 18.21, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea. There's a comparison to that in Jeremiah 51, only he throws it into uh, the Euphrates River. Cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. The voice of harpers and musicians, and of pipers and of trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more in, at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and, the, and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Christ and his church, they left. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Very interesting. A couple more places. Amos chapter 9, verse 14. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities. See, there it is again. The waste cities. The cities that nobody lives there. 
and inhabit them, and shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and they shall make also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I gave them, saith the Lord thy God. And just, I don't know, just maybe, maybe, something's going to happen in Israel, and God's going to run out every human being that's there. Maybe. Luke 21, 23, But one to them that are with child, and to them, this is a prophecy in, of end times. Woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there should be great distress in the land, and wrath upon his people, this people. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down in the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Wow. Is that going to happen again? The Word of God is the Word of God. Ephesians 4, verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. We just read that verse. Um, he ascended on high, he ascended, and uh, he led captivity captive and, and gave gifts to men. I don't remember where it was. Uh, but anyway, that's, he's, that's what he's, he's quoting from the Old Testament, where we just were. And um, that's what he's going to do. He's, it, and it's by grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So, wherefore he saith, when he sendeth up on high, he lead, led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So again, um, this concept that God is going to save Israel with a gospel in the last days, but it's going to be works-based and they're going to have to do and, and do and keep doing in order to maintain the salvation. That's, that's not what it says here. In Ephesians 4, Paul is, is actually matching the grace that we have right now mating it with the promise that God made concerning Israel. And they're kissing each other. And that's God's way of telling you, that's how I'm going to do it. I made a promise to Israel. I was going to lead her captivity captive. I was going to bring her back into the land. I was going to forgive all of her sins. And I'm going to do so on the basis of my grace alone. Through faith alone. Not works. Anyway, good study. Good study. You know what? I'm, I'm going to try to remember maybe to throw in a, a study on waiting on the Lord. Maybe that'll help you. Okay? I hope it does. I hope, I hope these Bible studies are blessed. They're a blessing to me. They really are. I, I need them. I don't just stand here and say, I've already accomplished 98.99% of this Bible. Just a couple things I've got waiting. I don't, I don't, that's not me. I still haven't attained to what I want to attain to. And I want God to have a lot of patience with me. And He has. And I have a lot of patience on God. If it had been, if it had been my idea, I would have checked out of here a long time ago. And it wasn't God's, wasn't, wasn't right. It wasn't time yet. So I'll wait on the Lord. I'll wait for His salvation. I'll wait for it and have patience and understand that what is holding me captive right now will one day be captive. And I'll wait. I love you. I love the Word. And I hope you love the Word too. We'll see you next.